Hi, I'm Richard Olin, and welcome to my series, Intelligent Disclosure. It's September 11th, 2018. I'm going to talk to you about 9-11. Tracy's here, and she's going to join me afterward. Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank all of you for being here. Um, I very much uh, enjoy doing these live stream shows with you. It's a different kind of a situation for me. Typically with YouTube, of course, uh, we normally will do pre-records and upload things. But with the Intelligent Disclosure Series, the fact that it's live stream gives something um, special that I, I'm actually really glad that we're able to do it this way. Uh, there's always this sense of... Uh, walking a tightrope because I don't always really know how these things are going to go. Um, but that's part of the charm and uh, part of the danger of doing a live stream. So um, so let me get going here. The 9-11 narrative, as we've now been told for 17 years, is like an infection in our society. And it's not simply that the official story is deceptive. But even more, it's led America, it's led the world with it down a dark road. We're still going down that road, and we need to find a way to turn our direction around. This is a cap that uh, was given to me by my dad. After my father retired as a New York City police officer, he was hired as a fire safety director at the World Trade Center. He worked there from 1994 till, until 9-11. It's a cool cap. I don't often wear it. Uh, I remember all that day trying to find out what happened to my father. Um, but of course, the phones were down. And at the end of that day, finally, other family members told me that he had had the day off. A very nice man that my dad shared his job with was killed that day instead. My father was one of the lucky ones, I guess. But uh, that day did something to him. And... Um, as the years went by, what it did to him just kept getting worse because really what it did is it sucked all the idealism, all the belief, all the hope right out of him. My father, who had instilled so much idealism in me, well, I just watched it evaporate. And if you're old enough to remember that day, you'll never forget it. The morning of September 11, 2001 changed the world. We learned that day that four commercial airliners had been hijacked by terrorists, that three of the aircraft had hit their targets, the two largest towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, the Twin Towers, and the Pentagon in Washington. The fourth airliner, we were told, crashed near the very small town in Pennsylvania called Shanksville. And we were told that it was probably headed for the White House. On that day, about 3,000 people were killed, and the images of the people jumping out of the Twin Towers, and then the images of those two towers falling, collapsing, disintegrating. This is really one of the most haunting images of, of our time and of my lifetime. That day, President George W. Bush and his team, including uh, Vice President Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, and many others, told us that America had been attacked by terrorists. They immediately told us this, and they immediately told us that a man named Osama bin Laden and his organization, which was called Al-Qaeda, and no one had really heard of Al-Qaeda much before, that they had carried this out. And it's very helpful to remember, by the way, that for quite some time after that attack of 9-11, uh, Bush's team also tried blaming 9-11 on another guy, Saddam Hussein, the president of Iraq. And they were so successful at this that millions of Americans really honestly thought that Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden were the same guy. Anyway, within a month of 9-11, the United States had invaded Afghanistan, where we were told Osama bin Laden was hiding out in a cave. About a year and a half after that, the U.S. also invaded Iraq and proceeded to destroy that nation. And even though by then the U.S. government had admitted Iraq had had nothing to do with the attack. Now, if you remember that day, you'll also remember that no one was allowed to question what we were told. President Bush actually himself said that he would not tolerate crazy conspiracy theories about 9-11. You remember that. And the entire media establishment completely conformed with his wishes because they didn't go there. Go there. Right on the heels of that trauma, 
the U.S. was subjected to another trauma, and that was the anthrax attacks. And maybe some people don't remember or know too much about that anymore. I can tell you that at the time, this was every bit as traumatizing to people as 9-11. And out of this one-two punch to the gut, we ended up with the USA Patriot Act, the Homeland Security Act, and the never-ending series of laws that have year after year eviscerated our rights as citizens. Privacy, gone. The right to habeas corpus, gone if the government labels you as a terrorist. A culture of conformity has spread from the mainstream media to the very fabric of our society. A rigid ideological mindset that has replaced the political with the cultural. It's like, don't question our politics, just focus on culture, language, race, identity, stay divided, fight each other. Meanwhile, we'll gobble up the rest of the world and your rights too while we're at it. Now look, there are countless analyses about why the official explanations of 9-11 and the anthrax scare aren't just wrong, but an insult to our intelligence. And I'm going to go over some of that, but that's only part of my purpose today because we have now lived with this lie for 17 years. An entire generation has grown up into young adulthood who didn't live through that day, who don't remember the world before, who've grown up with this event as the great backdrop of everything that's followed. They've grown up in the world created by 9-11. And we owe it to them as much as anyone, including the people who died that day. To understand clearly and honestly just what happened. And then to understand how that day has affected us for the last 17 years, because living with a lie that big does very bad things to people and to societies. So I wanna look at some of the key details of that day because there's a lot that's wrong with it. And I wanna start with the World Trade Center. We were told immediately, we were told repeatedly that those towers collapsed. We were told this with a full-on media blitz, that the crash of the airplanes and the fires caused a total collapse of the Twin Towers. Now, there isn't just one alternative narrative to this story. There are several. <clears throat> and all of them challenge this official story. I would say they debunk the official narrative. narrative. All of them will say, all of them do say in one form or another, that these structures were brought down through some form of controlled demolition, whether it is with highly advanced uh, conventional explosives like nano-engineered thermite or uh, more exotic explanations. You hear about a limited nuclear detonation. Uh, you hear about more exotic energy-based weapon beams and, and the like. And I'm not going to be the final judge of these theories, but I will say this. I will say that never in the history of steel frame architecture, not before 9-11 and not since 9-11, have fires, even fires that have raged for days, even fires that have consumed much of the building, have ever caused the collapse of the steel frame structure. And yet on September 11, 2001, this happened not once, not twice, but three times. Three times. Because another building came down that day, and that was Building 7 of the World Trade Center, which was a seven-building complex. And Building 7 was 47 stories tall. No aircraft hit Building 7. No aircraft hit Building 7. And yet, just like the North Tower, just like the South Tower, earlier that day, Building 7 came down at 520 in the afternoon in a huge billow of dust. Yeah, there was a fire on one of the floors, but this was not a towering inferno. And moreover, I would suggest watch the building fall. It's on YouTube. You see the roof cave in slightly, you see the entire structure come down at free fall speed, hits the ground in 6.3 seconds. All the available evidence on Building 7 prior to its collapse does not show anything more than superficial structural damage from the earlier destruction of the Twin Towers and a couple of isolated fires. That's it. The thing about Building 7, it fell straight down. And that meant, as with the other two towers, all of the load-bearing columns had to be broken at the same moment. You need that kind of precision if you're going to prevent a building from toppling over. This is what the science of controlled demolition is all about, which, of course, 
That's exactly what it looks like. Think about it. In all the history of architecture, the only times a steel frame structure came down like that was when a controlled demolition was responsible, never any other time. And yet this question was never asked by the establishment media, not once. All three buildings came down at virtual free fall speed. All that steel, all that support, all that matter offering zero resistance to the rate of fall, really? We were told that the fire melted the steel. Well, initially we were told this. Then the argument was modified because it was ludicrous. The steel won't melt until it reaches 1500 degrees Celsius and you can't get such temperatures without pressurized air like you get in a blast furnace. So instead we were told that the heat from the fires weakened the steel, weakened it enough in, in both cases to bring them down in huge piles of dust and at free fall speed. Um, Scientific American said this with a straight face in October of 01. BBC told us, Popular Mechanics told us, Nova Documentary told us, on and on. They all said the fire getting as hot as 800 degrees weakened the steel supporting the buildings enough to bring them down and I guess building 7-2. <laughs> they didn't get into that. But here's the thing. What you hardly ever hear is how unlikely it would be that those fires could have reached even those temperatures necessary to do that for any length of time. In particular, the South Fire Towers, surprisingly, not that big a deal, at least not from a structural standpoint. They never spread to the opposite side of the building. They gave a darkening smoke that, that dwindled as the morning went on. There weren't even any visible flames before it came down. The fire chief who was there, a man named Oreo Palmer, he was on the 78th floor of the South Tower. He described the fire in that building as, quote, two isolated pockets. He, he also told his fellow firefighters they should be able to knock it down with two lines. Well, the official report on 9-11 didn't even mention this fact that firefighters had reached the crash zone. And this should not be any surprise, since in the case of the South Tower strike, most of the fuel probably burned up in that huge impact fireball. Just look at the photograph and you'll see this massive, massive billow. So no, it would, there wouldn't be all that jet fuel burning up in there, creating blast furnace type temperatures. The fact is that the fires in the two towers went through a very similar progression. And initially in each one, you see widespread visible flames, light gray smoke, then the flames become smaller, the smoke becomes darker. When you get dark smoke and no visible flames, it means less heat and less intensity, not a pressurized intense inferno. So there's all of that. But you just go to the videos. You watch a vertical steel column simply vanish before your eyes. It doesn't crumple up, it doesn't fall over, it doesn't stand up jutting into the air like you would think, no. It disintegrates before your eyes. You see, the buildings of the World Trade Center didn't just collapse. They disintegrated into an exploding cloud of dust. We're talking about a thousand feet of intact structural steel and cement obliterated instantly. Now, these are reasonable questions, and I'm just getting started. Never mind that no steel frame skyscraper had ever totally collapsed, perfectly collapsed due to any cause or combination of causes. We're talking bombings, fires, earthquakes, hurricanes, nothing other than demolition. Never mind that the incredible disintegration of the towers didn't look like anything that's ever happened. Three times. And why did Building 7 fall? Well, it would have been nice to investigate, but that didn't happen because this entire crime scene, 16 acres, was off limits to any independent investigation. I mean, actually it was off limits to any investigation because all of the steel was removed. All of the steel was destroyed immediately after the fall of the buildings. These are the three largest structural failures in history, no investigation. Yeah, the government issued a report a couple of years later, but there is no way to do a proper investigation. 11 days after the attack, just 11 days, a company called Control Demolition, which by the way, did the cleanup after the Oklahoma City bombing, got the contract to remove the debris at the World Trade Center. The steel was sold cheap, to scrap metal vendors, and most of that was shipped to India and China as fast as possible. In fact, the trucks hauling the steel were actually outfitted with $1,000 GPS locators. And back in 2001, who had GPS? 
well, these guys did. The public was completely banned from the area. And when the government did issue its report, the big, that famous report and big white cover that everyone, all responsible people, you know, thought they should read, it never addressed basic questions. It never brought up the history of steel frame structures. It never addressed how the massive core columns just melted away. And it certainly did not address how Building 7 came down in a pile of dust. But oh, much, much of the World Trade Center may have disintegrated, <laughs> but we did learn that one of the hijackers' passports was found. How lucky, in the mountain of debris. We are told that the passport of the hijacker named Satam al sukami was found a few blocks from the World Trade Center. Are you kidding me? He was honestly, uh, his passport was honestly supposed to have been found in the rubble. He was uh, supposedly on flight 11. This is the plane that hit the North Tower. And just to remind you, in that collision, the building absorbed the entire airplane. So there's that. But the passport falls out. Oh, no. Yeah, the BBC announced the fall of Building 7 20 minutes before it happened. And that's on YouTube, of course. And then there's the famous statement of World Trade Center building owner, Larry Silverstein, who talked uh, in a Nova documentary about how Building 7 needed to be pulled. Um, and that's on YouTube. You can find it. Unless that's been censored now in the new era of censorship. Who knows? But I assume you can still find that. There's so much more. But I want to talk now about the Pentagon. Another serious problem of explanation. You have American Airlines Flight 77. This is a Boeing 757. It's supposed to have crashed into the Pentagon at 9.37 in the morning. Now, again, this is something in which there remains debate among 9-11 researchers. Plane, no plane, missile. Let me just walk you through this one. Officially, the flight was taken over after it had flown hundreds of miles away and was taken over by a suicide pilot named Hani Hanjour and two accomplices. He presumably fought his way into the cockpit took out the two pilots, even though one was a former F-4 fighter jock and a tough looking guy. I saw a picture of him. If you ask me, um, he would have been a tough one to, for anyone to take out. But somehow Hany Anjur gets control of this aircraft, even though he's five feet seven, probably weighs 135 pounds soaking wet, takes over the aircraft, even though he flunked a flight test the previous month for a little puddle jumping Cessna. But he had the presence of mind to turn off his transponder to turn the plane around above the clouds, and then surpassing Christopher Columbus in the art of dead reckoning, flew with precision back to Washington, D.C., saw his target, swooped down 7,000 feet in three minutes in a beautiful corkscrew maneuver. So good, by the way, that the air traffic controllers assumed he was a jet fighter and said, thank God, where have you guys been all this time? Because, of course, by then, the nation was already dealing with the World Trade Center. Anyway, he approaches the Pentagon at such a shallow angle that the wings clipped lampposts on the highway at an altitude of 20 feet and a speed of uh, about 400 miles per hour, which is essentially an impossibility for a plane of that size and that type. Um, a plane that's as large as a Boeing 757, I've read a number of studies about this, cannot fly level that close to the ground at that speed. The air pressure is too intense, it's too thick. And there's an effect known as wind sheeting, which will force that airplane either to go up or down. You're not gonna be able to fly level, not that type of aircraft, but something did, something did. And then plows into the first floor of the newly renovated West Block of the Pentagon. Now, I've interviewed three commercial pilots about that particular maneuver, and every one of them said they could never have executed such an incredible uh, feat of flying as that. And incidentally, any commercial aircraft that's clipping multiple lampposts is not going to keep flying. It's going to crash into the ground with a lot of fire and metal and bodies all around. Other things could do it, but a commercial aircraft, you try again. It's not going to happen. Oh, yes. And all we have in terms of evidence of the Pentagon hit are what? A couple of fuzzy still frames from a webcam attached to the Pentagon. That's the best we've got. In fact, we know there was a rooftop video on the nearby Sheraton Hotel, which captured this event. We have never seen this video. There's also a video from a gas station next door, which captured the event confiscated by government agents. In fact, 9-11 researchers have identified many other 
video cameras that have captured this event, no video of which has ever been made public. Why not? It's been 17 years. I think we can assume uh, that there aren't any plans to release, to release any of these videos. There were, however, people who were stuck in traffic when the Pentagon was hit, just outside, got out of their cars and took pictures. And you can see these on the web. If you look at these pictures of the damage to the building, this is a pattern of damage that is not consistent with the impact of a 757. First, in the images that are available, you try to find evidence of an aircraft of any significant amount. You'll see scraps of something on the Pentagon lawn. You don't see anything recognizable like luggage. You don't see seats. You don't see bodies. The lawn of the Pentagon looks almost like you could have had a picnic on it. There is one piece of aircraft debris larger than small shards, which was seen by passersby outside the building. And that piece, which has been identified as from an American Airlines 757, has been called into question by many 9-11 researchers who have argued that it was planted. Now, you might think that's going too far, but, it, but actually no other significant debris has ever been shown. It's very odd, to say the least. And then you've got the hole in the Pentagon. These images have been out there for years. Just go look for them. It just is not large enough to have taken the full width of the wings and tail of that airplane. Even if the parts were shredded on impact, they should have left a few tons of debris outside the building. And it's not just me. People who were on the scene couldn't explain what happened to 60 tons of aluminum that supposedly hit the Pentagon. The fire chief of Arlington County, a man named Ed Plower, was there on the scene on the day of the attack. A journalist asked him, is there anything left of the aircraft? You know? And what Ed Plower said is really amazing. He said, first of all, a question about the aircraft. There are some small pieces of aircraft visible, small pieces of aircraft visible, no large sections. And then he said, there's no fuselage sections or that sort of thing. He says, you know, I'd rather not comment on that. Oh, so you'd rather not comment on the fact that there was no fuselage sections available, visible anywhere. That's great. You really want to look into this. You can Google images showing what can happen to a commercial jet when it hits birds in flight. You can see massive, dense, severe damage. And the reason is that airplane fuselages are basically just a hollow tube. So you have to wonder, how is, how is it going to punch a deep hole through reinforced concrete of the headquarters of the world's most powerful military? Three rings of the Pentagon, six walls. We have a photo of that final wall, which has a clearly defined round hole about, uh, about seven feet or so in diameter. A couple of other things about the Pentagon strike. You had several witnesses describing a shockwave that knocked them to the ground, both inside and outside the building. There a number of people described it as like a concussion. Well, what was that? And maybe, maybe it was just as the government claimed and the jetliner had the world's greatest hijacker pilot, made the world's most impossible moves, slammed into the Pentagon and essentially disappeared into the building, leaving no fuselage or no parts that the fire chief could identify. But unfortunately, most of the specific evidence that would prove that it really was Flight 77 is unavailable to the public. The entire scenario, to me, seems incredibly improbable. And all we have to support the official story are statements from authorities, no evidence. Then you have the crash of United 93 into Shanksville. And uh, one question, where's the plane? No image of the plane exists anywhere. Why not? We're told some really silly things about Shanksville, like the plane melted right into the ground. Sorry, but that's not how planes crash into hard ground. Even, even somewhat softer ground is unbelievably dense. A large commercial airliner is not going to dive into the ground. Something hit the ground. Yes. But where's the plane? What exactly happened at Shanksville? Then you got the phone calls. You might remember this. There were a number of cell phone calls that were allegedly made that day by people in the various hijacked planes. To be exact, there were supposedly 15 calls that were described at the time as cell phone calls. And about 10 of those were from Flight 93, the one over Pennsylvania. Um, these calls were so dramatic that they gave this image to the world of 
passengers fighting to take back control of the aircraft. They even made it into a movie. Well, many researchers have looked into this, and the superb 9-11 researcher, David Ray Griffin, wrote about these phone calls. And he just pointed out that cell phone technology in 2001 made it impossible for cell phone calls from airplanes at altitudes of really more than a couple of thousand feet, especially calls lasting more than a few seconds. And yet many of the reported cell phone calls happened when the planes were above 25,000 feet and even 40,000 feet. And several of these lasted a minute or more. One of them reportedly lasted for 12 minutes. There's a lot more I could say about the cell phone calls, but I wanna move on. You've got real oddities about the strategy of the hijackers themselves. And you definitely have oddities about the response of the jet interceptors. I wanna talk a little bit about this. The four planes that were commandeered on September 11th either flew to their targets from very distant airports, or they flew hundreds of miles away from their target before they turned around. In other words, all of them had fairly long distances to fly before reaching their targets. Now, there are three international airports within five minutes flying distance from the World Trade Center. And yet the hijackers selected flights 11 and 175, which were from Boston. That's a 40 minute flight time. Flight 77, which was the plane that we're told hit the Pentagon, took off from Dulles Airport in Washington, just a couple of miles away from the Pentagon. But the hijackers waited almost until the plane had reached the state of Kentucky before taking it over. Flight 93 took off from Newark, New Jersey. If the hijackers had taken it over shortly after takeoff, they could have reached Washington, D.C. in about 30 minutes. Instead, they waited until it was near Cleveland, Ohio, before turning it around. Now, anyone planning an attack like this could easily have known <laughs> that hijacked airplanes in the United States would be intercepted within 20 minutes anywhere in the Northeast Corridor. But these guys chose to leave from airports over 100 miles from their targets in three of the cases and waited for nearly half an hour in all four cases before they took over the flights. That's one heck of a way to expose the entire plot to certain interception if air defenses were operating normally. But maybe these people realized that the air defense system would not be operational. There's a thought. For domestic air defense, the United States has had a nationwide air traffic control system that continuously monitors air traffic, and it's been in place for generations. In the case of any deviations of any aircraft from their flight path or loss of radio contact, air traffic controllers notify NORAD, that's North American Air Defense. NORAD is constantly monitoring air traffic and space traffic. If there is an emergency of any kind, NORAD can order the Air Force or any other armed service, actually, to scramble fighters to deal with the situation. And on September 11, 2001, every single part of that system broke down. Every single part. We know fate based on the official timeline. The response times for reporting deviating aircraft were many times longer than they were supposed to be. We also know that NORAD, once notified of the off-course aircraft, failed to scramble jets from the nearest bases and instead they scrambled them from much more distant bases. And then once airborne, the interceptors failed to reach their targets. Why? Because they flew at small fractions of their top speeds. Sometimes they flew in the wrong directions. Why? We're talking about multiple failures at each stage. If just one of these had gone right, just one, the attacks of 9-11 could easily have been stopped. NORAD had time to protect the World Trade Center, even given the unbelievably late time when it claims to have first been notified. It also had time to protect the South Tower and Washington, D.C., even given its very, very strange uh, choice of bases from which to scramble planes. But everything failed. Now, I want to talk a little bit about inside knowledge, because there's certainly more suspicious behavior about 9-11, including several events immediately preceding this event that suggested that a lot of people anticipated the attack. You have extremely large amounts of insider trading and what are known as put options. A put option on Wall Street is an agreement. It's, it's an option to sell assets at an agreed price on or before a particular date. So that means, in other words, it's really good for insider traders who know that a certain stock is going to fall. You get to sell at a much higher price 
that's been previously agreed on. And this happened in massive numbers to United Airlines and American Airlines stocks. Someone knew what was going down. Same thing for put options on reinsurance companies that um, expected to pay out billions of dollars to cover losses from the attack. And we're talking about companies known as Munich Ray and the AXA Group. And also financial service companies like Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, and the Bank of America, all of whom were very badly hurt by the attack. A number of important people admitted to have been warned not to fly that day. Probably the best known was the uh, then mayor of San Francisco, a man named Willie Brown, but there were many others. There was Donald Rumsfeld's statement shortly before 9-11 that the Pentagon had lost $2 trillion. There was the privatization of the World Trade Center just six weeks before the attack. And there were the war games. The late 9-11 researcher and former LAPD detective Michael Rupert uncovered something very important about this. In May of 2001, just four, three months, four months before 9-11, Vice President Dick Cheney was placed directly in charge of managing uh, the integration of all training exercises throughout the federal government and the military. So not only did the morning of 9-11 begin with multiple training exercises of war games and terror drills, but Cheney was in charge of managing them. And these included live fly exercises with military aircraft posing as hijacked aircraft over the United States. And this also included simulated exercises that place false blips, that means radar blips indicating virtual planes, on FAA radar screens. One of these exercises was called Northern Vigilance and it pulled Air Force fighters up into Canada, simulating a Russian air attack. So there were actually very few fighters remaining on the East Coast to respond and all of this paralyzed, or at least partially paralyzed the Air Force response. Dick Cheney also happened to be one of the main government officials deciding that these extensive war games would take place on that day. And it's worth bearing in mind that American intelligence had collected dozens of warnings from governments and military agencies indicating that terrorists were planning to hijack civilian aircraft and crash them into American targets on the ground during the week of September 9th, 2001. 9-11 did not come out of the blue. It was entirely within the realm of possible expected events, unlike what the US government later claimed. And Dick Cheney was basically running the show that day. I wanna have a word on the anthrax scare because, and sometime I'm gonna give a more extended treatment on the anthrax scare for this program since it's so very important and it, it really often gets for forgotten nowadays. I honestly think the reason it gets forgotten is because it's so embarrassingly phony that the establishment would rather just forget it now. But back in 2001, boy, was the public played. It letters with anthrax, which is a deadly toxin, being mailed from different parts of the Eastern US, all with badly written notes with poor spelling that sounded like crazy Islamic jihadists. I, you have to wonder, I mean, were they really so completely illiterate so that they wrote like they were in kindergarten? Anyway, all this time, we're talking October 2001, while the public is being whipped into a panic frenzy over these anthrax letters, while politicians and media professionals playing the line that all these anthrax attacks were from Al-Qaeda or from Saddam Hussein or from Muslim extremists, because all of these were put out there by the Bush administration and by the media. Um, one day after the USA Patriot Act was passed on October 24, 2001, the Patriot Act was being argued all during the time that the anthrax scare was front row center in the American news media. That is not an accident. One day after the Patriot Act was passed on October 24th, then we learn, oh, no, it was highly weaponized anthrax derived from the U.S. bioweapons program. That Bush and Cheney and all the rest knew this. And then they planted the seeds to frame a lone scientist, a lone American scientist, when the time was right. And he didn't do a thing. I would like to know one thing. Who wrote the letters? Why would a crazed lone scientist that no one believed had the ability or the motivation to access and mail the anthrax anyway from anywhere in the Eastern US, why would he try to frame Muslims? Those letters were written explicitly to frighten the public, to whip up support for the USA Patriot Act. 
The provisions of that act were so radical, so damaging to the fabric of civil society that they, they needed something very extreme to push them forward. And that's what we get with the anthrax attacks, which were nearly as important as 9-11 itself in galvanizing the nation toward the invasions that some certain people wanted and in passing the evil laws that certain people wanted, all in the way of creating what was really a revolution from above. That is not a revolution from the people, but from those already at the top. These events of the past matter because they changed our world, not just for Americans, because the legal revolution that took place in America, that's been brought to the rest of the world. When your rights are taken away from you, you have the right to know why. When your own government attacks you and then tells you that it needs more power in order to make you more safe, you're allowed to question that. You don't have to be taken in by the lies. Now, I realize it's hard for people to accept that they've been lied to on such a magnitude. I get that. Instinctively, we want to believe our official authorities. You may be struggling with some of the things I've been saying. And if, if you do, I understand that. It's like with my dad. He didn't want to go there. And when he finally did, it took something out of him that's never come back. But I need to talk about the repercussions of that awful time because it's really important. It lives with us to this day. After 9-11, after anthrax, we've had these major transformative laws being passed that have forever altered the nature of the American political system and life. And indeed, certain core freedoms and privacies that Americans had fought for and accepted as their birthright. The two most important laws passed after 9-11 have to be the USA Patriot Act and the Homeland Security Act. And there's no way to get around this fact. These laws were and remain extreme. They mark a decisive and dark turning point, not only in the history of the United States, but the world, because as the world's most powerful nation, what happens in the US has implications everywhere. The Patriot Act was rushed through a panicked Congress right after 9-11. Overnight, here's what the Patriot Act did. Vastly expanded the government's authority to spy on its own citizens. It reduced checks and balances on those powers, like judicial oversight. And you might consider it a bit galling, considering that if you're an American, you're paying for this police state. And you might want to remember that the United States government never, ever said that the 9-11 attacks happened because they weren't surveilling the population enough. <laughs> I mean, actually, much of the Patriot Act had nothing to do with fighting terrorism. So now U.S. intelligence agents are able to conduct secret searches of American citizens and in your homes and on your email without probable cause. They can use evidence found there to declare you an enemy combatant, imprison you without trial, deny you the right to confront witnesses against you. That's the Patriot Act. And under the Patriot Act, courts have no chance to review these decisions. And in fact, they might never even find out about these decisions. It allows the government to monitor religious and political institutions without suspecting any criminal activity. They don't need to suspect criminal activity to monitor them, all in order to assist so-called terror investigations, however loosely they want to define terror. That was once called freedom of association. Now it's under government surveillance. The Patriot Act also has undermined attorney-client privilege. It allows the government to monitor federal prison jailhouse conversations between a attorneys and their clients, and to deny lawyers uh, to U.S. citizens accused of certain crimes. Then you get the Homeland Security Act, the other major legislation to occur after 9-11. This went into law in November of 2002, created the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, which, by the way, I don't think people are aware, this was the largest federal government reorg since the National Security Act of 1947. And it was the Homeland Security Act and the Patriot Act that have really created the new national security state. It's important to know that these laws, this revolution in American politics hinged on 9-11 because without 9-11, these laws could never have been justified. And how do we know this? Because both of these creations were long since planned. The timing had just never been right. Regarding the Patriot Act, we have the statement of a former counterterrorism czar, Richard Clark. He was quoted. He said, I remember someone asking a Justice Department official, how did they write such a large statute so quickly? And 
Of course, the answer was that it had been sitting in the drawers of the Justice Department for the last 20 years, waiting for the event where they could just pull it out. That was the Patriot Act. So there's that. But here's something just as interesting, and I'm guessing you may not know this. The core of the USA Patriot Act was actually written in 1995 by none other than Senator Joe Biden, the man who became Barack Obama's vice president. Yeah, Joe Biden. He did this a few months before the Oklahoma City bombing took place. Biden introduced a bill called the Omnibus Counterterrorism Act of 1995, which called for secret evidence to be used in prosecutions, uh, expanded wiretapping and surveillance laws uh, uh, to create a new federal crime called terrorism that could be invoked based on your political beliefs. He wanted to allow the U.S. military to be used in civilian law enforcement, militarizing police and to have permanent detention of non-U.S. citizens without judicial review. Just come take them away. And Biden, by the way, was very proud of this. He was very proud of that. His 1995 bill was so close to the Patriot Act. He talked about this a couple of times. To this day, the official establishment media pretends one thing while the truth is something entirely different. And, And much of the current national security apparatus, indeed of the entire world for the past 17 years old, 17 years, has been created on the basis of 9-11, an event that is just not what it has been portrayed to us officially. Indeed, the evidence shows us that the story we've been given to is a lie, one that many researchers have been exposing for a long time. That lie stays with us to this day. Have you ever wondered what happens to people on a massive lie is foisted upon an entire society. You think it doesn't happen? It's the rule of most of our history. Rulers have always and constantly employed deception and spin and untruths of all sorts to get their way and to mind control their people. Good God, that's the norm. And in all cases, it does bad things. But in the case of 9-11, it's something of an extreme case in some ways. Think of 9-11 as a form of trauma-based conditioning. We know about this from studies of MKUltra and and the global crisis of ritual abuse, how you can split off parts of a personality by torture and trauma. It's horrible and it happens seemingly every day. Every now and then stories leak out about it. But I would suggest that trauma can work on entire societies. If you wanna change people's thinking and their behavior for the future, in this case, if you're creating a bureaucratized, legally suffocating world in which the tiniest fraction of people own the vast wealth that there is to own, and that's exactly what's happening, then you need to beat people down. You need to tell them, Americans especially, that their days of rights and privacy are over. You scare them 24 seven. You keep them convinced that the sky is falling every day and they need your protection. You change the culture. 9-11 was a form of trauma-based conditioning done to an entire society, an entire world. That lie is so entrenched now, so many parties are in bed with it. It's gonna be very, very difficult to dislodge it. How can someone who's bought this lie for so long, how likely is it that they're just gonna admit to themselves that they've been had? No one wants to admit that. And often, (laughs) The most formally educated people are the worst in this regard. The laws that were changed by 9-11 have taken us a generation later to a world that would be unrecognizable back then, a world of population profiling, including predictive modeling based on your digital footprint, a world of facial and voice recognition, a law, a world of comprehensive surveillance by street corner video cameras and soon, no doubt, by insect drones and more. And even a world of mind reading technologies, of virtual telepathy, technologies that are openly coming on board. Who knows how far they can go in the future? Nearly everything you do online is now being stored at an NSA data collection center in Utah. It costs billions of dollars just to build it. Every email, every text message you've ever sent is liable to be stored there right now. And you may not have access to your emails from, say, 2006, but there's a very good chance that they've got it. And if you try to ask for it, they might just tell you, you don't have a need to know. Just try asking them for it sometime. And it's not just your emails or texts. Any bit of what's called your digital pocket flint, a pocket lint, excuse me, is stored there. And and what we now see, without any question, is that 9-11 has created the justification for governments to strip you of any last vestiges of privacy you may have. And it's up to us to stand our ground. One positive development from 9-11, I guess, is that it 
really sparked pretty much an entire alternative media. I mean, there was an alternative media before 9-11, but really, it really took off in the aftermath of 9-11, which radicalized much of the thinking world. It sparked an entire culture of people who are resisting the encroachments of this obvious global system of control. Privacy these days means first and foremost digital privacy. I cannot stress this enough. Everyone is entitled to digital privacy. You hear arguments often enough always from dishonest people who have agendas that, hey, as long as you aren't breaking any laws, you've got nothing to worry about. Wrong argument. Everyone has a right to privacy. Don't let any government shill tell you otherwise. And one thing people should always have access to is encryption. And I'm just going to say, I've been looking into this last week, and there are a couple of secure email systems out there people should know about. And you can research these on your own, of course, and I encourage you to do so. The basic idea of encrypted email is simple. The program encrypts your email when you send it, and it is decrypted by the program for the recipient. The one I now prefer is C Templar, and I want to talk about this. This is a it's new, and I'm mentioning it because although there are other secure email providers, there are reasons to wonder if the U.S. government or other major corporations have backdoors and access to them. It's not easy getting true encryption security. In the US, every email server cooperates with the federal government. We all know about Google and Yahoo and how they've handed over email information that people have assumed was private. This is stuff that would have been inconceivable pre 9-11, but now it's a reality. I was disappointed to learn that some other secure email providers may be cooperating with various governments and large corporations. This is why I like C Templar and I'm telling you about it. I feel it's the best for a few reasons. First, it's in Seychelles, that's the Indian Ocean. It's a country that doesn't cooperate with other government requests for information, so no one can force them to turn over a list of their users, which happens in the US all the time. Secondly, their servers in Iceland. That country has the strongest data protection laws in the world. If another government, say yours, wants access to see Templar user accounts, they need to make their case to an Icelandic court, which are the most resistant in the world to giving out personal data. And actually, if C. Templar were forced by an Icelandic court to hand over user data, all they could do would be to hand over the encrypted messages. They have no access to the actual unencrypted messages. Which brings me to the third reason I like C. Templar for my encryption. All data is encrypted in a way that the management of the company can't access it. Um, they can only, accent, ac account access is only given to users. If you lose your password or your account info, you're out of luck. They, they cannot get it back for you. I've looked into this. I've communicated with the owner of the company. They have, another, they have a number of other tools, which I really like too. Favorite tools are a delayed delivery, which you could just send your message at any time in the future. But the one I really like is Dead Man's Timer. And this lets you send the email if you do not log in after a certain amount of time. Every time you log in, the timer is reset. You might be a journalist who wants to notify people that you're missing if you get detained. Or you might have information to share with the world in case you get killed. Oh, yeah, C. Templar uses open source code. Definitely a good thing. Their website is ctemplar.com. Seriously, go there. Protect yourself. You will finally have emails that are unbreakable. I have it, and I use it, and I love it. So... I'm glad that I ended up with that. We need to find tools like C Templar and like other digital tools out there to protect ourselves. Because if we don't fight back, if we don't defend ourselves, then we're toast. Because right now there is a global system in place. It's international. It is relentless. It is powerful. It is intelligent. And they know how to manipulate us. We need to wake up. And one thing that you can do on 9-11 is not buy into the prevailing narrative. On Google uh, search today, you go on there and it has a little remembering 9-11 icon. I'm like, really? Are you truly remembering 9-11 or are you misremembering 9-11? because the prevailing norm in this country is to misremember 9-11. And that doesn't do anyone any service. And it really annoys me when I hear people say, 
respect the victims of 9-11, you know, by uh, signing on to the official narrative. I'm like, are you kidding me? That does not respect the victims of 9-11. That does not respect the generation of young people who've had to grow up in the shadow of that event by buying into the official lies of that event. We respect those people by questioning that narrative, which is an insult to the intelligence of any person who takes the time to look into it. The problem is all too many people, they don't wanna look into it. They're comfortable with their world. They're intimidated by the prospect of a revolution in their paradigm. I understand that. I do understand that. In the year after 9-11, I was a young author. I had just written my first book. And um, a lot of people wrote to me right after 9-11. And they said, Richard, you really need to look at 9-11. And I wasn't there yet. It took me a little while. And I wrote back. And I remember telling people, maybe, maybe later. Maybe I'll look at 9-11 but not right now. And then I did. And I took a year out of my life to study the details of what went wrong with that entire explanation. And I'll never go back. What amazes me is that after all this time, it's been 17 years, you would have thought that the truth would have been out by now, formally, publicly, available for everyone to agree on. And yes, there is a very, very substantial group of individuals who know that 9-11's story is a lie. And yet the official fig leaf of truth cont continues. And that to me is astonishing. And I have to admit, I would not have expected it to have lasted this long, but yet here we are. We have our work cut out for us. But I just say this, don't despair. Just keep going. Just keep going. That's all we can do. Thanks for listening to this. I want to bring Tracy on. Are you ready to come on? My yeah, list? yeah. Great. Let's get to move. Let's see. Hi, everyone. It's kind of a different tone tonight with this, isn't it? Well, it's a serious day. And yeah. I, I didn't expect to get a little emotional earlier on, but what can I tell you? It's not the first time it's happened to me when I've talked about 9 11. No. Well, it's. Uh, you know, there's a lot to think about. It's very tragic. I remember exactly where I was, as yeah. everybody does, uh, when that happened. And um, I was in Canada, in Vancouver, and uh, someone called, obviously, super early in the morning. Mm -hmm. I was in between. I was just about All right, you were on the West Coast, so it would be quite early for you. Yeah, I was right. about to start a brand new career. Mm -hmm. So I was in a time where I was at home, mm -hmm. just before that started. And... Um, I'll never forget. You know, I think all of us sort of feel the effects of that day in our bodies still to this day. Yeah, I think I'm. Am I right in assuming that even uh, north of the border, up in Canada, people realize this was a big thing. This was a huge thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was the same for us. I mean, it was tragic. I know there's lots of Canadians on there and who've been listening tonight as well. And mm. um, yeah, it was. I mean, it doesn't matter where you were. There was someone who was saying earlier they were uh, a young boy in a European country and just, you know, he just sobbed. It, of course, right. I mean, it, it was just such a massive tragedy. I, I just want to say, you know, one of the reasons these false flags are as effective as they are is that it, they kind of marry the emotion to the intellect. So in other words, when, when some horrible trauma occurs like that, you know, mm -hmm. we 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 react emotionally. How can we not, you know, mm -hmm. because we're caring, empathetic human beings and, and we see all of this tragedy and we instinctively want an explanation for what happens. And what mm -hmm. you see with these types of events is that you have a prepackaged narrative that's rolled right out, very powerful. And yeah. so your intellect uh, is kind of married to the emotion as it were. And it's a very powerful. So, so that the intellectual explanation that we're given has this emotional impact. Mm -hmm. And and I I really feel like that's a big reason why people don't like to, that's why they don't like to argue about religion and politics in general, but false flags in particular that are so traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just think it's hard for people to, well, to talk about. Yeah, it's kind of like PTSD. I mean, it going back into the trauma of something and the emotions of that day, it, it's not something we generally like to do, right? Um, so I think instead of revisiting the emotions 
I mean, people do. Obviously, people do when you allow yourself to go in. But we tend to go, when we go back to it, we tend to go to the intellect, I think. Um, what, what was served up to us when that emotional opening occurred? I don't know if I'm explaining this well. But when there's a, are you going towards emotional-based uh, trauma? Oh, we well, were talking about earlier. Yeah, I mean, I I think you you actually raised this idea with me this morning when we were talking about it, which is this idea that you know what happened on nine eleven and in other types of false flags that have occurred um, is analogous to trauma based uh, conditioning. It's like how they split off personalities yeah. in trauma based. Um, in a sense, you were suggesting this to me that in a sense, you want to create a new personality for society. Yeah. Almost a sub personality. If you look at it on a personal level, but yeah, for our whole entire society, it's sort of a, the trauma is there an opening in the personality is there. And then there is a structure through the media to feed us a new, uh, way of thinking. Uh, it's a, it's sort of a perfect opportunity to plant a new ideology, a new story. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's similar to the, an idea um, in a book that I've, I've talked to a few times by um, Naomi Klein called uh, The Shock Doctrine. Mm. And it's it's a very good book. And she, um, she was just talking about how she was thinking of the U.S. military's motto of using shock and awe to roll over enemies. And I mean, think about that as a motto. We're going to shock you and awe you so that you can't respond. And she had this idea. It's similar to what you were mentioning here, that um, that's how that's how societies are ruled by shock and awe, like mm-hmm. through through trauma, through horrible events like 9-11 or Hurricane Katrina, uh, Katrina excuse me, um, that were used when people are most bereft, when they're most like just, that's when they look for the government for help. Mm -hmm. And that that gives governments opportunities to roll out programs that could never have happened otherwise. And that's definitely what happened with Mm 9-11, without a doubt. I want to bring up some comments and uh, some things that people have been saying. Um, One of them, uh, you know, some people are saying, obviously everything points to this being an inside job, but you know, nothing happens, you know, what can be done? What can, what can we really do? I mean, other than being dedicated to digging for the truth, dedicated to that. I mean, look, continuing um, to, I should say. Truth is a multi-stage process. You have to learn it. Um, You have to, you have to research, you have to learn it, then you have to speak it. And then ultimately someone has to act on it. So it's all of these different things. Mm -hmm. So all stages are essential. And and each of the following stages needs the two stages, you know, before. So you've got to learn the truth. Then you, but knowing the truth is only one thing. Then you've got to have the courage to speak the truth. That's not easy Mm -hmm. for a lot of people. And I understand like, you know, we're in one position here where we're, this is our life, like doing Mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But there are people who have actual jobs out there and they are not, it's not easy for them Mm -hmm. to just uh, put challenging opinions out there, particularly now in our era today where uh, there's so much uh, corporate surveillance going on of employees that folks have to be careful. Not only that, there's the emotions of the people who are invested in the traditional story. Absolutely. Right. So they feel uh, they're very put off by people bringing up the alternative narrative. Absolutely. So I feel, I mean, positive change can happen and it is happening. I believe, yes, it's been 17 years. Yes, I would have expected um, more of this to have come out by then, but it's still happening. There are still more people coming on board with understanding that the events of that day don't make sense. Mm -hmm. And, and by the way, like I'll never pretend that I know every single detail of what went down that day, because as I often say, I wasn't part of the club to do it. There's, there's a lot of things I'll never know. Mm -hmm. And I'm not obligated to know every detail, neither are you, neither is anyone. But what we are able to do is look at the facts as they're presented to us and be able to, to call BS when we see it. Mm -hmm. And, and that takes a certain amount of courage. And then what we have to do is well, there are people out there who are organizing. Uh, we're trying to get action done to move this forward in a more public way. And it's tough. It's tough work. Mm-hmm. 
but we've got to be patient and we have to be persistent and we have to maintain our integrity. And at the end of the day, that's what we've got. We've got ourselves. And, you know, uh, for our happiness to be dependent on getting the truth out on this one issue, that's not a good strategy. We've right. got to, we have to live good lives. We have to be good people and we just do our best. That's what I say. We just do our best. And at the end of that day, we, um, we can feel good about ourselves and knowing, look, we're not, we're not omniscient. We're not omnipotent. We do the best we can. And yeah. we, we hope other people will do the best they can. I think just keeping the dialogue open is really yeah. valuable. And I think for me personally, not belitt belittling people who believe the traditional story as well. It's more about educating as, as opposed to belittling, you know, so that's. I'll, I'll never, I'll never be silent on 9-11 and I'm, I'm watching the comments scroll and there's um, a number of them that I, I'm definitely agreeing with. And, um, you know, maybe we'll be able to come back to, uh, to 9-11 again. I mean, yeah. some people want me only to talk about false, uh, about UFOs and some people <laughs> want me to talk about other things and yeah. like, look, uh, a memo to all of you, I will talk about the things I want to talk about and you can't tell me one way or another. And we'll probably be coming back to 9-11, um, you know, and, and where I want to go and how far we want to go. Yeah. One, someone mentioned Alex Jones, and, and I think it's worth mentioning here that Alex Jones is one of the first uh, major names out there to question the, the narrative of 9-11. And he was right to do so. And it's not an accident, in my opinion, that uh, he was targeted by the corporate establishment for the longest time and demonized mm -hmm. for the longest time. And it's not to say that everything that's come out of his mouth is exactly perfect. I mean, my God, I would listen to him many times and just roll my eyes. But, uh, but this is a guy who's been out at the front of the fight and particularly on 9-11. And it's really one of the most important uh, battles that we can fight in our society. 9-11 um, is no, it's not irrelevant. And it will never be oh, irrelevant yeah. until it's like a boil that has to be lanced. And you, we will not be healthy until that boil is lanced. Can we, um, a lot of people have been asking about Dr. Judy Wood's uh, work. Can you just speak about that a little bit? I will a bit. Uh, I, we have her book um, downstairs in the office and uh, it's called Why, um, How Did the Towers Fall? It's, it's an excellent book. Um, I highly recommend it. I think it's available in the U.S. I got a very expensive U.K. version of it. Um, yeah, Judy Wood um, is uh, she's a PhD in engineering, I believe, and she's spoke done a lot of research on the fact that there are. She's really the person who's put forward the for, forward the idea that the destruction of the World Trade Center was done by exotic beam energy beam mm. weaponry, and the argument she puts out there is that when you look at the detailed level of damage done, she points out like automobiles near 9-11, for example, mm -hmm. how they were like half melted. Yes, uh, half that was another melted. comment that I wanted to bring up. Yeah, Correct. And this is the case. And the question is, how does this happen? It's, there's not, um, to my understanding, a, a conventional explanation that can account for that type of phenomenon. So there's something bizarre about it. And then, of course, the fact what she calls the dustification of yeah. the towers themselves, the fact that they, they don't just collapse. They do turn into dust. There's a YouTube video. Uh, anyone can watch this of watching the towers come down and you see a steel pillar essentially disintegrate right before your eyes and how it's there and then it's just gone. And I don't understand how, how steel at the base of the building, I mean, there's no fire where this steel was, just turns to No fire there, right but cars eyes. on fire further away. That's, that's right. So there's oddities about this. And, and I never felt qualified to uh, comment as an engineer, but I try to keep track of what other professionals have to say. And, and the thing is, the 9-11 community, people think UFOs are vicious. 9-11 researchers really go after each other. Uh, they're a tough crowd, and uh, many of them have gone after Judy but very, very, uh, mm. very stridently, very viciously in some cases. And, um, you know, I, I, years ago, I got attacked by a few people because I was strongly considering the nanothermite idea. Mm -hmm. uh, that was put out by the University of Copenhagen way back in, I think, 2004. And that I thought then, and I still think now, there, there may be something to this. Mm -hmm. uh, some people say it's a red herring. Others, no. But the fact is that 
there were microscopic particles of nano-engineered substance called thermite, mm -hmm. which is highly explosive. And in the late 90s was only, to my knowledge, in the possession of the US, um, possessed by the US military. Um, so what's that all about? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's different competing theories, but as I, I've said many times, like I, I don't feel uh, the obligation to have my gavel and just to put it down and say, this is the answer in 9-11. Um, but I do feel that it's, it's anyone with enough detachment on this event who sees the facts that were presented to us, the, the claims, I should say, that were presented to us, mm -hmm. and then looking at the facts on the ground to the best extent possible, we'll see there's something desperately wrong with this explanation. And that's, right. that's all that I need to go to at this point. Uh, I'll let other people duke it out in terms of the technical aspects. So any other comments you know? Uh, do there? you think the planes were remote operated? Well, I've often wondered about it. Um, the fact is that it was possible then as now to remotely commandeer an aircraft mm -hmm. uh, with uh, software. And when you when you think of the maneuvers that were done with particularly the aircraft that hit the Pentagon, um, could this have been done with a large commercial aircraft? And as I mentioned in, in my chat here, the three commercial pilots, experienced pilots that I spoke to, none of them said that they thought it was possible that an, a commercial pilot could have done that maneuver with that type of right. aircraft because it's a big clunky bird. It's not a fighter jet, but something did it. So you have alternate theories. One is that it was a much more nimble aircraft, um, uh, a drone of some sort, and there are a couple of candidates or even a missile, or uh, maybe it would be possible to make a larger aircraft uh, do the maneuver if you had remotely operated uh, software, but I don't know the answer to that. Right. So there's different possibilities, um, but I've definitely heard them and um, they could well be true for all I know. It's particularly galling to me that the video cameras of uh, the Pentagon hit are still not available to us. Yeah, And I mean, that's, that's galling. You know, for years, the government uh, under the Bush administration said, well, they were too traumatic. They were too frightening. I'm like, come on, are you kidding me? Um, even a few years after 9-11, people wanted to see these, and yet they yeah. were not made available, and they've wow. not been made available. And now it's like everyone's forgotten all about them. Well, that brings me to this. Um, are any of the DOD files available via FOIA? And if so, have they been studied? I don't agree with all the theories, but agree the events deserve scrutinizing. Yes, they do deserve greater scrutiny, and it's a good question, and I don't want to uh, answer if I don't know the full the full uh, truth about it. I I assume that the that FOIA requests have been made of a lot of this, mm -hmm. and um, and we would probably know mm -hmm. if some revolutionary uh, uh, revelation, I should say, were to come out through it. So, good question, and that's probably the best I can say. Okay. Had you ever heard this? Did you know that Back to the Future, the film from the late 80s, consists of very clear reference to 9-11? The director knew about the plan a good 12 years in advance. What are your thoughts on this? Have you ever heard that before? Um, I, I'd never heard that before. I, actually, I did oh, hear did? a vague connection with Back to the Future, but I guess I couldn't remember that level of specificity. Um, look, there are claims that the that 9-11 was known and that hints were thrown out there long, long before. Uh, I don't know. I can't speak to that one. There's a claim about the in the TV show The Lone Gunman, uh, which was a spinoff from the X, X Files, that they had mm. uh, a pre knowledge of 9 11 shortly before that happened. Uh, the most compelling uh, statement on this that I have heard, and I, I nearly was going to mention it, but I'll just talk mention it now, is a statement by the filmmaker Aaron Russo, who's he's dead now. Aaron Russo. Uh, did three classic films in his career. He did uh, classic comedy, Trading Places with Eddie Murphy oh, and right. Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, yeah. He did uh, The Rose of Bette Midler, so a classic musical. And then he did a classic documentary called America, Freedom to Fascism. Highly recommended, even though it's 10 years old now. After Aaron Russo did this documentary, he uh, uh, ran for uh, office, I believe, I think in Colorado, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to make changes, you know, to mm -hmm. make a positive change on on truth about what's going on in America, and and talked in an interview shortly before he died about his relationship to Nicholas Rockefeller, so one of the Rockefellers. Nick Rockefeller was major uh, venture capitalist, lots of money, of course, 
And Rockefeller befriended Russo and essentially tried, according to Aaron Russo, bring him into the fold and to stop him from his uh, muck, uh, rabble rousing type activity. And Russo, he was really wondering, like, what is it about Rockefeller? And Rockefeller said to him, why do you care about these people? Mm -hmm. and, and Russo, if you listen to this interview, it's just, it's a beautiful interview because you, you can't help but really like this guy. Um, he's like all the guys that I feel like I grew up with, except he was from Chicago instead of New York. But he said, why do I like, why do I care? It was because I care, I care about people. You know? yeah. And his whole attitude was Rockefeller was like, didn't understand that. And, and then said to him at one point, this is a year before 9-11. He says, look, this is all going down. All right. The whole plan's in place. You mm. can't stop it. No one can stop it. This is before the Bush-Gore election mm. of wow. 2000. The whole game was in, according to Russo. And, and Rockefeller said, yeah, we're going to microchip people. And we're going to have this uh, planes will crash into buildings. And it's all going to be a big hoax. This is Russo describing it. And then, of course, a year later, uh, that's what happened. And I believe Aaron, Aaron Russo for sure. I believe that there was the, the fix was in and it was in before the election. How long before? I don't know. But but it was definitely planned. And and this is the thing that, you know, it doesn't matter if you think that you're a Republican or you think that you're a Democrat. If Al Gore, the Democrat, had been elected president, or if he had won the election, I argue 9-11 still would have happened and it still would have been an inside job. It wouldn't have mattered. Mm -hmm. Because you got the deep state, and that's what makes it happen. Um, but probably, probably Bush's team needed to win. They had Dick Cheney. They had Rumsfeld. They had, they had a really bad team of people running that White House. And Cheney was probably the worst of the bunch. But they were all very, very bad and just totally lacking in ethics of any sort. Um, and they made that event happen. I think they were the. I think they were the right team. You know, they were part of what was called Project for a New American Century, PNAC. And I, I nearly was going to talk about them, but there's only so much time to get into these things. But there's so but they were much to, that you can go into. Hardcore yeah. neocon, neoconservative group that really was looking for a reason to, uh, to make this type of thing happen, to create the revolution that they wanted. I remember, I don't know if you remember this, but we had um, someone we were speaking to who's in the military and said they were a part of a drill a year before that looked almost identical to oh, yeah. uh, what was going on in 9-11. I mean, there are so many avenues to still explore. That's the interesting thing about this. Um, but let's go to a couple more comments or questions. So, okay. We'll go for a little longer and then uh, probably call it a day. Yeah. I just thought this was interesting. Someone wrote this. Uh, September 11th, 1609, Henry Hudson discovered Manhattan. Hmm. September 11th, 1941, ground was broke to build the Pentagon. September 11th, 1990, Bush Sr. gives speech entitled The New World Order. That's right. 11 years later, 9-11, 2001, obviously, 9-11. Yeah, there, there's some, well, and you're getting into the, a theory that there is numerological significance to some of the dates that happen in our world today. And, and I, uh, I don't know for sure if that's true, but I don't rule it out. Um, you know, there... This is something I've never really delved into in, in a deep way. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm familiar with some of these claims that there's a an occult nature to those people at the very top of our hierarchy. And I think we really need to take this claim seriously because it does look like whether or not you believe that uh, some of these practices are valid or genuine or, or accomplish anything, the, the truth is that it certainly does appear that those people believe it. And and if they believe it, that's that's enough. And numerological significances may may matter. By the way, there's another very important 9/11, and that's September 11th, 1973, which was the date that the United States orchestrated a coup d'état in the nation of Chile, which brought uh, Augusto Pinochet to power. And that's a very very important date, um, bad date in modern history for sure. Okay, uh, a couple of times this has come up. The auditors of the missing money were in the area. Um, that was hit. Is that true? Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, you, know I, about that? you know, this was claimed actually years ago by Jim Mars, the late Jim Mars, who talked ah. about it. And um, it could be true. I, I, I don't know that it's true. Like I've never right. seen my own actual confirmation that that was the claim. It is true though. All right. That, that a month and a half before, and then one day before nine 11, 
There were statements from Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld about unaccounted for expenditures that the Pentagon was trying to deal with uh, that exceeded $2 trillion. Now, keep in mind, at that particular time, the Bush administration was, was new in power. They had just been elected. This is They were in their first year. So when Rumsfeld's talking about all of these Pentagon irregularities, he was really kind of laying it at the doorstep of the Clinton administration. So right. there's really no skin off the Bush administration's nose, as it were. Uh, so he's talking about all these accounting irregularities and money that was just who knows where it went. And he said, yes, uh, it, uh, it's in July of 01, he said it was $2.6 trillion. And then in September 10th, it was $2.3 trillion. Um, our friend, Catherine Austin Fitz, mm -hmm. who uh, follows this as well as anyone in the world, said to me, she said, when she heard that statement in the news on September 10th, her attitude was, nothing's going to stop this house of cards mm. from falling now that this is getting public traction. And then came 9-11. Wow. And then that whole issue just went away. Wow. So, and by the way, if you go on the useless, worthless Wikipedia article on the missing money, and Wikipedia in some ways is great for certain conventional things, but not, not for the important stuff. If you go to the Wiki article on the missing money, um, they just blandly say that uh, Dov Zakheim, who's in charge of resolving all this stuff, did resolve it and got that discrepancy down to zero within a year. And I'm like, seriously, that is not possible. That is an absolute lie. Uh, Catherine said to me when she became Assistant Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in uh, 19, um, was it 89, I mean, she was always a financial expert. And she said, well, I'm number two in this department. I want to see the budget. They said, you don't have authorization to see the budget. She says, say what? I do indeed have authorization. After fighting enough people, they finally wheeled the budget into her office. It was wheeled in on those old library carts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's stacks of books. Yeah. There's stacks of papers. Cart after cart after cart. She looked at it. She thought, who the hell is ever going to be able to audit this department? It, she, she realized it was an impossibility. Right to audit HUD. And that's just the way the system works. So there's no way. I'm sure that's the idea. Yeah. It was not possible to resolve a discrepancy of 2.6 or $2.3 trillion. Absolutely no way. And by the way, there's now the discrepancy that Catherine um, has been talking about um, relating to the disappearance of 20, and this is along with Professor Mark Skidmore. Yeah. Um, of $21 trillion, $21 trillion over about 20 year period of time. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm in touch with them and we, we talk about this and uh, they are working very, very hard to try to figure out how this money could have gone away, where it could have gone and so forth. So this issue is not over. I totally agree. And she uh, definitely impressed upon us that that number is continuing to rise as they look deeper into it. In so, all likelihood, yes, it's higher, yeah. much higher, much. I'm just reading that. Yeah. Okay. There, there's so much more to go on here. And, and honestly, to, I don't even know who's got the most definitive 9-11 book at this point. I mean, uh, it would have to be like a 2,000-page book to cover everything that needs to be covered. I mean, there's to cover every angle, uh, domestic and international angles, by the way. And, and yeah. we're talking, by the way, U.S. relationship to other nations. Uh, top of the list has got to be Israel. Second has got to be Pakistan. Um, both of these nations had very, very interesting things going on with U.S. intelligence that day. Mm -hmm. Everyone's talked about, um, you know, how, I mean, the Project for a New American Century, where a lot of them were very close friends of Benjamin Netanyahu, who had actually done policy statements for the Israeli government. And this has to be considered. And this is, by the way, um, you know, it's not anti-American to criticize my government, and it's not anti-Jewish to criticize the nation, the government of Israel. So just get off of that. Anyone who wants to go down that road with me can try, and you're going to lose. Um, it's not the same thing. It is totally fair game to criticize any country, that uh, government policy that's out there. That includes the U.S., that includes Israel, that includes Pakistan, that includes Saudi Arabia, that includes Britain and Germany and France and everywhere else. So, uh, so there are these international connections that we have to look into and that are mm -hmm. important. Um, and yet, you know, what we find in our society is that we're in a straitjacket, a yeah. straitjacket of yeah. conformity and fear. I think people are afraid mm -hmm. to speak out and, and, and it really makes a difference. Okay. 
as to how we do this. All right, we, we don't, like, this is one thing that, that was uh, the big problem with Alex Jones. I mean, it was his strength and, and his liability, his emotion is, I mean, it gets, it works up and he strives to, um, um, you know, gets very uh, emotional and, mm -hmm. and it's easy to use that against him. But right. what we need to do is, um, is to stay calm and collective. At least that's my, my favorite approach. And everyone's got their own way of doing it. But I think to move this issue forward, we want to be calm. We want to be rational. We want to be objective. I just want to say, you know, I've heard people criticize you in the past as, as not being uh, patriotic, but I think that questioning the narrative is actually being, you know, I will always say that you are patriotic. This is why, because you care, you know, you care, you want to dig for the truth that the truth is most important to you, but it's because you love your country. So it always kind of upsets me when I hear people who um, nobody's saying that on the chat. I I, I don't want to say that. No, but it, it does come um, up. But Absolutely. It, but it does come up. You know, we, we have had that. And uh, I just think um, that's really wrong. You know, it's sort of your well, love of your ideology about what you want your country to be, what you what your hopes always were for your country, you know. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I have a, a ridiculous love for the history of the United States, and, and uh, as George Carlin said, for the freedoms it used to have. Um, and I believe in that, and I believe in, I mean, I'm not saying America is perfect or has ever been perfect. America had slavery, for God's sake. America wiped out the native population that was here. America did a lot of bad things, mm -hmm. but but there's been many great things that America has done, and, and I'm never going to forget that. Right. Uh, America as an example to the rest of the world, as an example of what um, what it means for, for ordinary citizens that have basic freedoms. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's revolutionary. And that's a beautiful and powerful thing. And hell, I believe in that. And I, mm -hmm. I believe that America, it's the one thing that we still have, like we've still got this idea, this belief, this, this thing to hold on to that is a, that can be like a beacon for us in the future. And uh, I hope we, we never, we must never lose that. Um, what, what's, um, What's distressing to me is, is, you know, all we're now a full generation after 9-11 and we see the culture yeah. changing. We yeah. see, you know, there was no social media when 9-11 happened. Yeah, that's really hard to uh, reconcile in no my Facebook, mind. No Facebook, no YouTube. There wasn't, yeah. And now we're exist. talking about, yeah, right. They didn't exist. And I think and so, about where email was and now we're talking about secure email being the most important thing, you know. That's right. And, and, um, and so what's happened is that social media it's a double-edged sword, right? Because people can use social media to communicate with each other and, and it can be powerful, but it's also obviously now being used to manipulate people and to spy on people. It is the ultimate surveillance tool. So uh, all of this has happened post 9-11. It's almost right. like you see 9-11 as this event that opened this huge gate. And now that the gate's open, the enemy army is rushing through mm -hmm. with all of these other things that are going on. Um, social media, the surveillance software, the equipment that's now fully online. As, as William Binney, I think, called it a, a turnkey totalitarian state. I think that's his phrase. Mm. Um, these are things that are possible now because the technology is possible. And the last thing, I, I know we've gone on a little long here, yeah. but in my view, 9-11, seen from the point of view of those people at the top of our hierarchy, was a necessity. It was a necessity from their point of view because they saw by the 1990s that we were now moving into a world where all of these technological toys were available for them right. to surveil and to control us. Mm -hmm. This new thing called the internet, these computers, and the development of that would allow them the ability to monitor and control people to an extent that was unprecedented. And I believe that this is what they wanted. They want control. They want a completely bureaucratized, legally, um, like a legal straitjacket system for the entire world. And the only way to do that is you've got to beat people over the head. You've got to traumatize them. And you've got to like do trauma-based conditioning to the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's what 9-11, 9-11 isn't the only thing. Uh, there's other false right, flags that have happened, course. but it's the big one. It's mm -hmm. the it's the transformative one that that really opened the gates, yeah, and now has allowed all this these other things to come through, including, uh, you know, we're on the verge of a 
transhumanist revolution and um, an AI revolution and uh, a globalization revolution. Yeah. Uh, a robo apocalypse, which what what's going to happen yeah. when you've got a huge amount, amount of the population that really can't get gainful employment? Right. right? That's a restless population. And so I believe 9-11 uh, was seen as necessary, if one of the reasons, to intimidate a population because you don't want people thinking they've got rights when they're hungry and out of work and angry. Right. You want them to be afraid. So it paved the way. And that's right. It opened the door, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a form of a, of conditioning, form of conditioning. Mm-hmm. You know, frightened people. And um, someone writes here, um, kicking back. By the way, thanks for the uh, for the super chat. Kicking back. Writes: America was founded by dissenters. Those still loyal to the crown were equivalent to the neocons of that era. Yeah, good point. And by the way, while I'm at, I just want to thank everyone who supported um, me and, and Tracy tonight for this. Um, the reason that I do what I do, honestly, is because I'm just fanatically dedicated to it. But to do it, um, you know, this is what I do. This mm-hmm. is what we do. And so those of you who support our work, I, I just want you to know we're very grateful for that. So uh, everyone tonight, thank you for your support. Thank you for the super chats. Thank you for the words of encouragement. And thank that you means for being here. Too. Just thank you to yeah. everyone who uh, showed up. Thank you. Um, well, what do you think? I think it's time to wrap up, but it was uh, it was really nice for all of us to be able to be together this way tonight, I think, on this day and uh, talk you. about this. So, Look, we honor 9-11 not by repeating the bland platitudes that come from an official corporate establishment that doesn't give a shit about you or anyone else that really matters. That's not how we honor 9-11. We honor 9-11 by looking into the truth and by speaking the truth and by being brave. That's the best way to honor the dead. That's the best way to honor those of us still living, fighting this fight. And it's the best way to honor the young people who've grown up in a post 9-11 world and they don't know the before times. And we can remind them that there were these things called freedoms, freedom of privacy, freedom of association, freedom to express your opinion without being culturally shamed. All of these are post 9-11 developments, dangerous, and they need to be fought. Agreed. All right. So, uh, you know, we usually go through everything uh, that we have going on, but I think we're going to skip that tonight. There's always the events page on our Richard Dolan member site where uh, you can look up what's going on. Um, Just want to thank everyone again. Yeah. And thanks as always to Laurie and Michael who who do uh, really the heavy lifting and uh, and manage the chat room while we're doing what we do. And, um, and if you want to keep on what uh, Tracy and I are up to, you can go to richardolanmembers.com. There's a lot of activity going there. I'm about to put some new information up uh, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow morning. And, um, and go to Richard Olin Press. I've got lots of books there, lots of activity. And um, I'm working on a couple of projects right now, that, uh, including, including a book on the history of false flags. That has not gone away. So yeah. um, hopefully that will be coming in the next few months. If you want uh, to keep track of uh, all the videos that Richard is releasing and support him, you can subscribe to his YouTube channel. And uh, if you enjoyed tonight's discussion and Richard's research on this, uh, feel free to like the video. That's another way you can support his work. And subscribe. Yeah. So. You'll know when we're on. Yes. Okay. So hope, wish everyone a wonderful evening tonight. Thanks all for being here. We'll catch you next time. Yeah. Good night. Peace.